Well, I've argued that there's no such thing as free will. So what is there? Well, there's luck, both good and bad, as well as what we make of it. Actually, that's not quite true. What you make of your luck is also just more luck. Once again, you didn't pick your parents. You didn't pick the society into which you were born. There's not a cell in your body or brain that you created. Nor is there a single influence coming from the outside world that you brought into being. And yet, everything you think and do arises from this ocean of prior causes. So, what you do with your luck and the tools with which you do it, even down to the level of the effort and discipline you manage to summon in each moment, is more in the way of luck. Now, most people resist this idea, seemingly at any intellectual cost, for reasons that I can't understand. Because this single insight is the antidote to arrogance and hatred, and a profound basis for compassion for others who are less lucky than you are. But before we get into the ethics, we need to clear away some more confusion. I once met a rabbi who seemed to understand my views about free will the moment I expressed them. And he conceded that the notion of free will made no sense in a naturalistic world, only to then claim that we were therefore lucky to live in a world fashioned by a just and loving God who has given each of us a soul endowed with free will. Hence the possibility of sin and our victory at overcoming it. And hence the reality of God's justice if we fail. Of course, this equation wouldn't apply to children born with congenital diseases, who in most cases didn't even have brains with which to sin before they reaped more than their fair share of justice. But nor does it apply to anyone else when you really think about it. But I knew not to take this line with the rabbi, because he was just the sort of man who would say that God's will is a mystery, as though merely reiterating this platitude could render an all-knowing and all-powerful God also good in the face of all the needless misery and death we see all around us. The topic of our conversation was free will and whether or not a soul could confer it. So I did my best to stay on point. I asked the rabbi how much credit he wanted to take for the fact that he hadn't been given the soul of a psychopath. He was aware, of course, that some people have such souls. I suggested that he and I were both very lucky not to have been so endowed. But the rabbi just waved this question away and declared that there was nothing I could say on the topic that could change his mind. Because, you see, the workings of the human soul are, wait for it, a mystery. I suppose I should have seen that coming. Now, this is where a wiser man than I would see life as a comedy and enjoy a good laugh. I'll admit that these encounters sometimes bring out the nihilist in me. A claim this empty, expressed with such evident self-satisfaction, causes some part of me, some small part that other parts are struggling even now to expunge, to hope that a distant asteroid will just be nudged out of its orbit and set on a collision course with Earth. The fact that this educated man, with a large congregation, who was in a position to lead others, intellectually and ethically, could present such an ugly tangle of ignorance and superstition to the world, as though it were some marvelous puzzle of his own invention that no mortal could solve, actually made me furious. Now, he, he must have mistaken the look on my face for a blow landed in debate because his eyes now acquired a triumphant gleam. And he then claimed that without free will, there could be no such thing as reason because people would be doomed to think whatever they would based on the laws of physics. Indeed, the very effort I was making to reason with him now proved that I too believe in free will. In fact, if you search YouTube, you can find Noam Chomsky saying the same thing in response to a question after one of his lectures. This is a very common claim. It is also ridiculous. But the rabbi paused dramatically at this point to let the meaning of his words sink in. And I hear you should picture a peacock, plumage spread in full, wearing a yarmulke. So now please consider what this rabbi wouldn't. Your thoughts and choices arise out of each present state of the universe, okay, which includes your brain and your soul, if such a thing exists, along with all of its influences. 
whether random or not. Your thoughts, intentions, and choices are part of this causal framework. So your thoughts, intentions, and choices matter because whether they are the product of a brain or a soul, they are often the proximate cause of your actions, and yet they are caused in turn by events that you did not bring into being. Reasoning is possible, not because you're free to think however you want, but because you are not free. Reason makes slaves of us all. This is why the rabbi's point and, and Chomsky's point make no sense. It matters that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and it matters that you understand this. Are you free not to understand it? No. Not if you do, in fact, understand it. Are you free to understand it if you don't understand it? Again, no. Whether you understand or not isn't under your control. But the difference matters, absolutely. Anyone who believes that 2 plus 2 equals 5 will find no end to his troubles, because the world will oppose him at every point, beginning with his own fingers. You are part of reality whatever it is altogether. Where is the freedom in this? Your beliefs about the world are formed in a perfect crucible of prior causes. If I say something now that changes your mind, it will be through no free will of your own. And if you're left feeling merely doubt or confusion, or you come away convinced that I'm a lunatic, you won't have chosen those responses either. So freedom never enters into it. The universe is pulling your strings. But our beliefs about the world matter because there's an enormous difference between knowledge and delusion. The physicist David Deutsch, who I had on my podcast, has argued that knowledge can produce any change in the universe compatible with its laws, because if a change can't be accomplished with sufficient knowledge, this could only mean that some law of nature prevents it. Now, you can be forgiven for thinking that this reasoning sounds circular, but I'm convinced it isn't. You should listen to that podcast with David if you want to explore this point further, because I thought it was a great conversation. It was podcast 22, entitled Surviving the Cosmos. Now, according to Deutsch, given the right knowledge, you could take any arbitrary region of space, sweep together its stray hydrogen atoms, transmute them into heavier elements through the process of nuclear fusion, use these elements to assemble the smallest possible machine capable of building all other machines, and then produce intelligent creatures vastly more capable and sensitive than ourselves, atom by atom. All that is lacking is an understanding of how to do these things at every stage along the way, which is to say, all that is lacking is knowledge. So knowledge literally is power, and what we do as a species on the basis of our ignorance might very well destroy us. So the stakes couldn't be higher. A friend of mine once met a group of villagers in India who had made a daily habit of drinking small quantities of a toxic fluid that they discovered in an abandoned generator. It was, after all, Beejley juice, electric juice. They thought, how could a substance so integral to the workings of a dynamo do anything but increase a person's potency. Of course, my friend tried to reason with these people, but he was rebuffed as an ignoramus and a tender-footed colonialist. Now, he didn't stay long enough to witness the aftermath. And of course, there's no shortage of such examples. The Chinese still imagine that rhino horn confers similar advantages. Now, presumably, this belief has less dire consequences for their own health, but it remains quite fatal to the rhinos. With or without free will, Beliefs have consequences, and part of living an examined life is putting one's beliefs in order, and one's beliefs about free will are no exception.